Good afternoon. My name, my name is Burton Bargestock, and I'm co-director of the National Collaborator for the Study of University Engagement, a division of the Office of University Outreach and Engagement at Michigan State University. I welcome you to the Engaged Scholar Speaker Series, and I'm delighted to see so many folks this afternoon. Uh, thank you for attending. The Office of University Outreach and Engagement fosters MSU's land-grant mission by connecting university knowledge with community knowledge in mutually beneficial ways. UOE supports the university's academic units and MSU extension on priority issues of concern to society by collaborating with faculty and academic staff to generate, apply, transmit, and preserve knowledge. UOE also conducts research designed to explore and demonstrate disciplinary and interdisciplinary impacts of engaged scholarship and university community partnerships. In all its work, UOE emphasizes university community partnerships that are collaborative, participatory, empowering, systemic, transformative, and above all, anchored in scholarship. Within UOE, the National Collaborative for the Study of University Engagement plays a national leadership role with respect to conversations about the scholarship of engagement. The collaborative seeks to advance greater understanding of the nature and role of community-engaged scholarship through original research and publications, institutional studies, reflection and professional development programs, advocacy, and national collaborations. The collaborative thanks its co-sponsors for today's event. And it's a long list, <laughs> including the Department of Physics and Astronomy, the College of Natural Science, the National Superconducting <coughs> Cyclotron Laboratory, the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams, the Institute for Research on Mathematics and Science Education, Abrams Planetarium, Graduate Women in Science, the Creativity Initiative at MSU, the MSU Community School of Music, Lyman Briggs College, the Residential College in the Arts and Humanities, the Honors College, the Bailey's College Program, and the Graduate School. We've missed very little of the university in this lesson. <laughs> Today's speaker is Lily Asquith. Lily Asquith received her PhD from University College London in June 2010. Her research focused on the, re the, the search for the elusive low-mass Higgs boson, the subatomic particle believed to endow everything in the universe with mass. Proving the existence of the Higgs boson is one of the main goals of the Large Hadron Collider, LHC, located deep beneath the border between France and Switzerland. Dr. Asquith is one of the originators of the LHC Sound Project. Through this project, a group of particle physicists, composers, software developers, and artists convert data from both real and simulated particle co collisions at LHC into sound. The aims of the project are to attract people to the results of the LHC experiments in a way that is novel, exciting, and accessible, to establish mutually beneficial communication between the often disparate fields of music and science, and provide composers with access to LHC data, and to introduce particle physicists to the possibility of using sonification as an analytic technique, and to begin to establish methods available for doing this. The LHC Sound Project won an award from the Science and Technology Facilities Council for Public Outreach. Dr. Asquith's innovative approach to making particle physics data available to the public has also been featured on National Public Radio. In August 2010, Dr. Asquith accepted a position as a postdoctoral research scholar at the Argonne National Laboratory in Chicago, where she works today. On behalf of my colleagues with the National Collaborator for the Study of University Engagement, and of course, our many, many co-sponsors, please join me in welcoming today's distinguished speaker. Thank you, Bert. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I've, as I was explaining to Mark, who's doing the sound, I'm a bit of a wanderer when I speak, possibly to do with being a bit nervous. So I may be moving away from the microphone like this. And if you can't hear me, just do that with your head. And I might see you and go back. Um, okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to be talking about LHC sound, which I think is why everyone's here. Um, but I'm also going to sneak in as much of, as I can about my favourite thing, which is Atlas, um, the detector that I'm working on, the detector that we use to collect the data that the sounds are made from and the detector that's going to find the Higgs boson, perhaps in the next year or so. 
and give us the answers that we're, we're hoping to get from this experiment. So these are the things that I'm going to talk about today. Um, why I love particle physics is the first thing, and I'm not going to make it boring. Um, the Large Hadron Collider, which Bert just mentioned, um, is the machine uh, which is, uh, we're using to collide particles, which is based in Geneva in Switzerland, but which has a huge number of US scientists working on it. Um, I'm going to talk about how I make sounds out of data, and then a, a few words about whatever next. Uh, this picture here is something that was drawn by um, my colleague Toya Walker, who's an illustrator and artist, and it is uh, supposed to be the Atlas Detector um, as a music box, which is a, a nice idea that she had, which was inspired by this. And this uh, this golden snitch is a, a reference to Harry Potter. So the thing that we're we're seeking is the Higgs boson. Um, perhaps we won't find it with sound, but it might help, or it may at least help encourage people to enter physics who are smart enough to uh, do things that will find it. So first, what, what is LHC sound? Um, so a bit of a silly slide, as a lot of my slides are. Um, it began in South London, which is where I'm from, which is why I have this accent, which I'm trying to play down so that people can actually understand me. Um, I was writing up my PhD thesis in the winter before I finished, and this is what this pile of paper represents, and the sad face, because I was actually at that point in my life that many of us have probably been at, where I didn't think I wanted to do physics anymore. I hated physics, I hated my thesis, I hated my life, and it was all miserable. And so I got on a bus, and this is a 37 bus from Clapham Common to Brixton, and I went to see some musician friends um, who lived in Brixton, in South London, um, who happened to have bought a new drum machine. And we were playing with this and making some sounds. And I had the idea that some of these sounds sounded a bit like particles whizzing around. So this is a silly story, which is really how the idea came to be. I think people think it was a really sort of clever or wonderful, strange idea, but it wasn't. It was just having fun with things that I like doing that were in fact making me miserable before. OK, so why I love particle physics. Um, so particle physics has many questions in it that we can answer, and some that we have already and some that we haven't. And I think that I'm going to play you a little video, which is by a politician, in fact, um, telling us some things which I think sums up particle oh, physics. The message, there? the message is that there are known knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. But there are also unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. So when we do the best we can and we pull all this information together, and, and we then say, well, that's basically what we see as the situation. That is really only the known knowns and the known unknowns and the known unknowns. OK, so that's, that's Donald. Now, I couldn't actually uh, embed this in my talk because for some reason, whenever I did so, the talk would just get corrupted and uh, crash. And, and so I had to put it separately. Um, but I think, that, I think that he was suffering a bit there because it became clear that he was kind of not making himself clear. But I thought that was wonderful, what he said. This is exactly what I'm trying to say here. There are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me in physics because that's exactly where we are in particle physics. And we have to admit, and we're quite ready, ready to admit that we don't really know anything. Most of it is unknown unknowns. But we have to start somewhere. Um, so start with the known knowns. Uh, and they're pretty amazing, although very few and far between. So this picture here, uh, I'm wondering, and I'm speaking loudly so you can still hear me. This picture here is of all of the fundamental particles that we know of, um, that we've worked out from experiment. Um, the only one here that we haven't discovered is this Higgs boson, which we're looking for now. Um, only three of these are really relevant to us, actually. So this is the up and down quark, 
and the electron. Um, those three particles and those three particles alone make up everything in this room, including you, uh, your heart, your lungs, your blood, the air you're breathing, the ground you're standing on, and the sun, the stars, everything in the solar system. The others are all uh, unstable which means that they can exist for a very short amount of time and then they turn into the ones that we know. Um, all atoms are made out of just those three things put together in different ways. So to me, this is uh, quite amazing. Um, we don't see quarks on their own. Uh, we infer their existence. This history of the universe picture shows where we are now on the right, where we have people thinking about philosophy and going to talks on, on engaged scholars. And on the left, we have the Big Bang, which was the moment of the creation of the universe. And just after that, we have a whole bunch of free particles. But after not very long, they, they got tied up into matter. They made nucleons. They made bigger particles. They were bound inside them and then they stayed like that forever, which is why we're here. So in order to look at these particles that were free at the beginning of time, we have to try and go back to the conditions that we had at the beginning of time. And as you go more and more red on this diagram, it gets hotter and hotter it gets more and more energetic and the universe gets smaller and smaller until eventually, of course, we reach a point of no size and infinite heat. Um, we're not going to try and recreate that with the LHC, but we're going to try and get as close as we can safely. OK, so this is just another way of trying to state that. This is the universe is about 14 billion years old. It was the first millionth of a second that we're interested in of this 14 billion years, because after that, it, it was all done. It was all finished. All the atoms were made that ever will be made. OK. So the known unknowns, and now it just gets more interesting. Um, so why do particles have mass? So let's go through this equation. Actually, uh, let's not. So that's just, that's just my best joke ever, because um, we're not obviously going to go through that. It's horrible. It's called the Lagrangian. Um, it's not very nice. So let's leave that and just think instead. Um, why do particles have mass? Or why do we care would be my first question if I hadn't talked about it already. Well, we care because we don't know why... First of all, we don't know why particles have the masses they have. This picture on this side shows all the particles with the mass along the y, along the upwards axis. So as you get higher up, you're higher in mass. And you can see right over on this side, you can see that black dot is the Higgs, the one we haven't found. But all these other ones have been found, and they've been measured. And as I said, these three are the ones we're all made of, and all these other ones are just things that decay. Uh, but they exist, just briefly. Why do they follow this weird, ziggly, zaggly line in mass? It's something that physicists don't really like. We like things to have meaning or reason or at least to find a relationship between one thing and another. And with mass, this just doesn't come out at us. Well, the other really, really vital thing about mass, of course, is that things have to have exactly the mass they do in order for us to be here. So if you change the mass of the proton, which is what's inside the hydrogen atom, by just 10%, you don't have any life in the universe. You have no stars forming. You have no atoms at all, and the reason why that is is because the proton becomes unstable and decays. And if you adjust the mass of the electron by just 0.2%, you get a similar result. No life. So none of us, no stars, nothing. So mass is kind of quite crucial, and we have no idea what causes it, what, you know, why the things have the masses they do, until this guy Higgs came along and gave us a, a quite, quite a good theory that we haven't proved yet which says that particles get mass because of the Higgs field. I'm not going to go into that today, though. So all these other questions, these known unknowns, these things that are absolutely huge questions that we just have no idea how to answer. What happened to all the antimatter?
because when the universe was created, we know, or if we, if we know anything, we know that matter and anti antimatter were created in equal amounts. They have to have been, because that's how it works. We see this happen all the time. Uh, if you create a particle, you create an antiparticle too. There's no other way to do it, unless all the laws of physics are wrong. So where is it? It's just not there. Are there antimatter galaxies out there somewhere? Well, maybe there are, but I don't think that even answers this question completely. Why are galaxies rotating so quickly? Well, in fact, why are the edges rotating so quickly? We're on the edge of a galaxy. We're in one of the arms of a spiral galaxy, where we are now. And we're moving too quickly around. So we should be moving according to a certain law called inverse square. It doesn't matter if you don't know what that is. But we should be moving at a certain speed. And we're moving too quickly. And this suggests that there's more mass out there than we can see. This is something that people may have heard of as dark matter. The third point here, why is the universe expanding at an accelerating rate? It's not growing but slowing down. It's speeding up. What's causing that? What's causing the universe to blow apart at faster and faster rates? This bizarre thing that we call dark energy but know nothing about whatsoever. It's just a, it's guesswork. Um, are there extra spatial dimensions? So just to throw this in because it's a possible theory. We think of space being something that we can imagine and visualize in our head as having a, this, this, and this dimension. What if there are others that we just can't conceive of? It would explain certain things, um, according to some theorists. So these are all the known unknowns. And this is just a diagram that shows what I just said, really. But it's trying to um, tell you how much of what there is. So just 5%, all these top four boxes, of the universe is made of matter that we have any understanding of. All the rest, we have absolutely no idea what is going on. We divide it into dark energy and dark matter, but that really doesn't mean anything. We don't know what it is. We can't observe it. We can't measure it. We can't do anything with it. We could just come up with crazy ideas, and no one can stop us. OK, so in the unknown unknowns, well, just a question mark. Of course, I can't say what they are. Uh, maybe. <laughs> But maybe one of you has an idea, you know, or maybe one of your kids does, or maybe some kid is, uh, you know, about to die of starvation somewhere. I don't know. It's really sad to think of that, but someone should be born at some point who's going to come up with an answer, or at least a question that makes us think, because we are really, really lost, and uh, we, know that, we know that, we're aware of it. So we're struggling around in the dark, but we have the LHC now. So we're going we're gonna to do some good things with it. So I'm going to tell you how much I love it and how amazing it is. It's large and it collides hadrons. So that's where it gets its name from. Um, you know what the large and the collide are, but the hadron is just a weird word. And I think in America you pronounce it hadron, although you didn't. So I don't know. I say hadron. Um, this is a hadron. So it's a kind of hadron. A proton is a hadron, so is a neutron. And there's several different kinds of them. Um, in the Large Hadron Collider, we generally collide these things, protons. Um, it's not called the Large Proton Collider because sometimes we collide other things. So I guess the people who work on the experiments that collide other things were just like, no, you know, we're not, we're not calling it protons. But we should do because it's less confusing. And this is what a proton is. It comes from the nucleus inside the middle of an atom. Um, we make them to collide by getting a bottle of hydrogen gas. And hydrogen is just a proton and an electron whizzing around it. We just strip off the electrons and then we pump the protons into a big, long pipe. Which, and then we, we turn them around with the magnets and we make them faster and faster and faster um, until they're nearly at the speed of light. And we keep accelerating them even then. And when they're going that close to the speed of light that they can't go any quicker, they start to actually get bigger, because that's what happens in particle physics. They get really, really big, and they, they grow in their, their cross-section, we call it. And then when they collide, you get an almighty um, mess of debris. So um, they're not fundamental particles, protons, because they've got other bits inside them. So f to be a fundamental particle, you can't be made of anything else. You just have to be made of yourself. 
And that's what these things are, quarks. They are fundamental. So you think, well, if you collide something which only contains quarks with something that only contains quarks, how do you get other stuff? And you get other stuff by releasing energy. So the two protons collide and release energy, and that energy is just available for anything, any of these little creatures that lie in the vacuum all the time to just jump up and become real just for a little moment. And that's really what happens. So this is why we built it. We want to work out what's inside protons, what holds them together, why we're here, you know, just all that kind of stuff. And um, so we built this enormous, gigantic machine so that we can take apart the protons, so that we can look at the very, very basic bits that make up matter. And this is our machine. So um, you can see these things here are the detectors, the four main detectors. There are another couple of small ones. Um, but the top half of this picture is France and the bottom half is Switzerland. Um, me and my daughter used to live just here and Geneva Airport is just here. So it's a very, very big machine. And it's kind of international. It's owned by everyone. And here's some quick facts on it. So the whole circumference of it is 27 kilometres. So these, these protons go uh, a very long way round. The magnet, magnets that keep the protons bending, because they don't really want to bend naturally, they have to be superconducting to be strong enough to do that. So to be superconducting, they have to be extremely cold. In fact, they're the coldest thing in a solar system. They're colder than the space uh, just outside our atmosphere. They're just close to absolute zero, which is minus 270 centigrade, which in American is something like minus 460 Fahrenheit. So very, very, very cold. Um, a proton in these beams does 10,000 laps, this 27 kilometer thing every second. So they're really going very close to the speed of light. Um, and the detectors are recording an enormous amount of data, so we can't record everything that happens in these collisions, but we do our best to record the interesting stuff. Um, we do record, we can record 15 million gigabytes of data per year. So that's, uh, so the amount of printed information in all books in the world, times by a thousand, is what we, we'll be recording. Um, the black hole thing, I've just put as just another tease at the bottom here. When we first started running the experiment, lots of people said, you're going to make a black hole and we're all going to die. And then they didn't say anything when we didn't. They, they didn't say, oh, yeah, sorry, we were wrong. Um, so I just, I just bring it up at every possible occasion just to rub it in that we didn't make a black <laughs> hole. <laughs> so we can't, you know, we can't say that we definitely won't. But we can't say that we definitely won't make dragons either, and it's about the same probability. <laughs> OK, so this is the Atlas detector, which is the biggest one on the LHC, and it's my one. And on the left there is, it is before it got finished. On the right, it's still not finished, but that's my first visit to it, um, which was just really exciting. And I've got a little film which probably won't work which just shows the building of it. Uh, it didn't work. Oh, that's really... I'm really sorry. So I was going to say, actually, that I always put videos and sounds in these talks, and always something goes wrong. So hopefully some of the others won't go wrong. Oh, there it is. Look. OK, let me turn the sound off. OK, so this is, this is working now. So we don't, it's all going to be random from now on. We don't know what's going to happen with the films. This is Atlas being built, and we've speeded it up in one minute. So we have these... Um, these webcams in the, in the pit, which is about 100 feet underground. And it took, you know, 15 years to build this thing. Um, but we've just speeded it up here and made it a minute. So these big things, oh, that's too quickly for me. You can just look at it and think, wow, that's the best detector I've ever seen. In particular, it's much better than the second biggest one at the LHC, which is called CMS, which is inferior. So there's the inner detector going in. This giant great thing here, which is being built, that's called a muon wheel. OK, so that's it. So I'm very pleased with myself that the video worked. We'll see what goes wrong next.
Okay, so Atlas is a huge, massive experiment. Um, it's one of the detectors on the collider, and there's 3,000 of us working on it. Um, this is the number of meetings we have a month. This says 4,000. Um, that's why that's what I look like most of the time, rather than that which I thought I would be looking like. It's not glamorous. It's not. It's really miserable most of the time. No, it's not really. It's brilliant. Okay, so here we have another film, and this is just to show you what happens when the protons collide in the middle of the detector. So it's kind of hard to visualise unless you've seen it a thousand times, like I have. So here's some help. There are the protons, and there's them colliding. So these things, these lines that are coming out of this point, these are the particles that were made in the collision, and they're shooting out into the detector where we measure them. I'm just going to play that again. Oh, no, I'm not. Yes, I am. OK, it doesn't look like I am. Sorry. So this is something that we can take a photo of. So what I just showed you, this collision, showed uh, two little balls coming in from either side of the detector, hitting each other in the center, and then a big spray of stuff coming out. So in this picture here, we have the detector. Here's a couple of little people, just to show you how big it is. We have a beam of protons coming in this side, and one coming in this side, and they collide in the center. Now, if you're looking at it like this, you get a picture like this. And this is called an event display. Um, we use these all the time. Um, we use them for education. We use them in newspapers and things like that. Um, we also use them in physics analysis. I was using them just the other day to take a look at some events. And this is a kind of beautiful picture, like a photograph of uh, an event of the aftermath of a collision. And this is what it used to look like in the 70s, the same sort of thing. This is tracks in a bubble chamber, which is what we used to have to look at. Now we have 80,000 computers to analyze the data, and we occasionally look at one of those colored or animated pictures. In the 70s, they used to take real photographs. That was what they used as a detector, and then they would use their eyes. So they had teams of people, sort of uh, junior scientists, just looking at these photographic plates and trying to spot new particles like that. OK, so on to making sounds out of data. Um, and apologies for those who found it boring for the very long introduction. Uh, but I think you need to understand that stuff in order to really know what I'm talking about. So this is how we do it. Um, so first of all, you can actually make sound out of any data. It doesn't have to be exciting atlas data. It can be uh, an insect walking along a table data. So this is my example for, for today. This is a millipede, and her name is Maud. And I'm going to record her movements in a table uh, because I want to tell you something about Maud without showing you this boring numbers. I want, to show you a, I want to play you a sound instead. So I've recorded three things about her. She has 47 legs. Hopefully, th I mean, that's a mad number of legs. No, no biologists here to tell me off. Maybe she lost a leg in a fight or something. Um, she's got 12 centimetres long, and she walks at 10 millimetres a second. So I can tell you that those things about her by showing you this table. Or I couldn't, or I could do something better. I could map these things that I've measured to audible properties. So I'm mapping physical properties that we're used to to audible ones that we can hear. So in this example, I'm going to say that the number of legs Maud has is going to be mapped to volume, that her length of her body is going to be the duration, so the duration of a sound, and the speed she's going at is going to be mapped to the pitch. So a slow mod would have a, a low pitch, mm, and, a, and a fast mod would be like, mm. in case anyone didn't know what pitch is. Maybe my daughter, I don't know. OK. so. Um, how can I use this data? I can tell Maud from a different millipede with, with fewer legs, obviously just by listening to the sound, because the sound that the millipede with 30 legs making is going to be different. Maud's going to be louder because she has more legs. Um, if she has a baby and it's only small, 
then I know that it's smaller than Maud um, because the sound is a shorter duration. And if Maud was running very quickly, I could tell just by listening to this sound, this single note, because the pitch would get be higher than what I was used to. This is for nearly all the sounds that we made in this project. This is just all we did. Um, it's parameter mapping. It's taking something that we can measure and it's turning it, it's mapping it to an audible property, something we can hear in a sound. So these are the things that we are particularly good at hearing. Um, we're really, really good if we close our eyes at knowing where a sound is coming from, even with our eyes open, but you can just play the game easier if you close your eyes. So I think we're, we're better like this, in this sort of plane around us than we are above our heads, just because where our ears are, right? You can't use them so well when you're, looking, when you're thinking about up here. But we're really, really good at this plane of saying exactly where a sound is coming from. I think it's about three degrees that we can pinpoint a sound to. And a similar thing with the spatial absence of sound. If a whole room is full of sound, but there's a little bit where someone's not making a noise, I'm also really good at, at, at hearing that, of hearing that silence. So you can play you know, at home doing this. Um, we can recognize tiny, tiny differences in rhythm, in tempo, and in pitch over time. And we also, strangely, I think, we, we, we agree very clearly, human beings, on what sounds good and what doesn't. Um, I, I mean, I've, this is very interesting to me and I'm sure to lots of people, but I, I, don't, I haven't heard an argument for why this is that's really convinced me. Um, why do we agree on what sounds good? Not, not me and my daughter, personally. <laughs> I mean, we, that, that's not a good example, right? But generally, we know what sounds in tune and what doesn't. Um, why don't we use our ears if we're so good, if they're so good? Why do we always use our eyes when we analyse data? We don't use our ears, really, for any kind of work. OK, so just as I mentioned before, event displays, these photos of events, where an event is the aftermath of a collision in the detector, these are used all the time, and I think I mentioned before as well, is I used these just last week. I was using them. I had some very, very odd results that I was looking at, and I thought, well, you know, there's about 200 events here that, oh, you know, the first thing every young postdoc thinks is, I've definitely found a new particle. And then you, you have to, you know, you go and tell someone, and they just go, oh, you're mad, go and look at the event displays. And then you realise that you're mad. So this is what I did, and you know, I saw immediately that I was mad because there were huge um, dumps of energy along this region in the detector, um, which aren't physics. They're the beam getting spilled, and I never thought of that because uh, it just wasn't obvious to me until I looked at the picture. So they're really useful, these things. They're not just good for putting in magazines or on websites. But we do actually use them all the time. I thought maybe we could do something with our ears that was similar to these, these useful event displays that we use our eyes with. Um, so my initial thought was, what do these particles sound like? And I instantly knew, I knew exactly what every particle sounded like, just as I could always assign a colour to them all in my mind when I was an undergraduate. Um, this is something that people, you know, people personify these things that they love. Uh, I love particles, so I know that electrons are blue and sound like xylophones and... I think a lot of other physicists that I spoke to had the same kind of idea. And some of the quotes I got up here, they knew as well, but they didn't agree with me, unfortunately. So um, the, the thing that came out of this, really, is that they thought that... So these things that they're talking about at the top here, hadrons, um, they tended to all agree that hadrons hitting the detector sounded really complex, kind of ugly. What have they said? like a man carrying 12 pints on a tray falling down a long flight of stairs. And that's, you know, that, I can imagine that that would be what this kind of thing would sound like if it had a sound. It's, it summons up that kind of thought in your mind. It's messy, it's difficult, it's a di bit dangerous, it's quite a strong noise. Whereas these less complicated particles, um, they seem to invoke feelings in people that people thought they were more musical. So, for example, 
Here we go, J size, this particle which has two names because it was discovered by two people at the same time. They're tings on a high triangle. Electrons go twang like a very high note on an acoustic guitar and muons are a much deeper twang. So these are just some of the comments I got when I first started out here. So the idea itself was quite gradual and, and very confused at the beginning. Um, it, it was a small project which, which began with myself and one musician and then this one musician who is called Ed Chocolate introduced me to these two other composers. Um, this is Richard and this is Archer and between myself, Richard and Archer, we are LHC sound. So we are really the, the entire project other than lots and lots of people who have collaborated a little bit and supplied sounds or supplied pictures or supplied some kind of input. So we talked together over a long period of time, particularly myself and Richard. And we turned Atlas data into sounds by this process, which is this wonderfully interesting picture of code. Um, the data comes in this format when I see it. It's, it's, uh, it comes in code, basically. Um, and I turn it into numbers. And I then send it into this program that Richard wrote, which turns the numbers into sounds. Um, let's just hope this works. So this is the first sound that we made. Um, unfortunately, there's a huge black square over the picture, but I don't think it matters too much. Did you see a little glimpse of it then? Let me just do that once more. There. <laughs> once more. Okay, anyway, it, it, it's showing you the picture that I showed before, which is like, you know, this looking head on at the detector, so what you see is a circle. So the first idea that we had was to do a kind of uh, sweep of the detector, like you imagine um, the radar on a, on a battleship or a submarine, you know that it goes round itself and it goes boop, boop, and the beep is when it, it hits something. So we thought, what happens if you stand in the middle of the detector and you do that? And there's a lot going on, right? So you're going to get... So we made this sound um, using real data. Um. OK, it works. So this is, this is real Atlas data using tracks um, from the detector. So the tracks of the particles. Uh, every time we hit one, we have a, a note. And the pitch of the note is mapped to uh, how, how much momentum it carries, or how much energy, how energetic it is. Um, energy is kind of proportional to speed, so you could relate that somehow to how fast that particle was moving. I'll play it again while I tell you what it is. Um, the very short distances between the notes are because there are, the whole detector is full of these things. And that's how noisy it is in there. Um, this is what we have to deal with. And the loudness is, I think, mapped to the distance out. I'm sorry. I've, yes, the, yeah, sorry, the loudness is mapped to the distance outwards from the, the collision point where the detector is. So this was the first really simple example that we made. We were quite pleased with that. We tried it with a few different instruments. I think that's a marimba that Richard chose for that one. But then we moved on. So we pl actually played with lots of things, and I'm just going to show you a few examples today. Um, this is an example of jets, which is my new favourite topic in physics, and it's what I've been working on for the last year. And a jet is a spray of particles that is created in the collision, a single particle will decay and then those particles will decay and then those will decay so you've got like a shower where the number of particles increases and increases and increases out in a sort of cone shape and this is what we've tried to draw here so in this example we've um, again chosen three things to map to sound um, we've decided that when you go I'm sorry about that sound 
So we've decided that as you go outwards from the interaction point, which is kind of like time moving on, this is time moving on in the sound. Um, when you go outwards from the axis of the jet, so when you get further away from the path along which you're moving, this is the uh, pitch. So in green there, that's the pitch, and that is higher if you're further off the beaten path, as it were. And the energy is, um, is mapped to volume. So a lot of energy deposited. So these are splodges of energy we're talking about. It's where the particle stops, it dumps all its energy, you've got a, a splodge. Um, we're talking about a cone full of splodges. So if the splodge has a lot of energy, it's loud. So this peters out and goes on for quite a while now. But the point is, I think that if you were, if you were at the centre of a detector when a collision happened and the particles that were created were going out towards the outside of the detector and you were moving along the centre of their path with them, this is what you would hear around you. Boop, 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 all around you as you moved along. Now you've got to the very outskirts of the detector, hardly anything is happening out here. But there's a little beep. I'm going to cut the rest off. OK, so another example which is kind of different is we thought, well, forget about the physics. I think it was actually when we had trouble getting hold of some data. We thought, let's just listen to the inner detector. What does the actual detector itself sound like? If you just fire simulated particles, so when we say simulated, we're not talking about real data. We don't even need collisions to be going on in the detector. We just use software. So we use the software detector and we use software events. What happens? I mean, what do they sound like? What does it sound like when you just fire particles through this bit of the detector? And so this bit of the detector is probably about, about well, up to here is probably about as tall as me. And these are just layers and layers of silicon. And there's, there's a layer in here as well. So I call that the first layer. This green bit's the second layer. These blue bits are the third layer. And that great big yellow, it's called a drift chamber. It's a kind of different kind of detector. That's the fourth layer. So you have four possibilities for a sound in this example. So when you hear that, the fourth sound is different. It's higher in this case. Or in that last one, it was actually absent, which we signify with a clap. Um, the reason why this sounds the way it does is because we map the pitch to the number of hits in here. If you get a lot of hits, which you do in layer four, then you get a high sound. This is kind of a funny example, but I actually, sound-wise, I really like it. So I thought I'd play it to you. OK, and so uh, just uh, uh, nearly to the end, but a really a very different example, something that Archer, who was, as I said before, Richard and Archer were the composers I was working with, most of the sounds I just played were, were things that, very simple things that Richard knew that my very limited knowledge of music I could understand and we could work together with. But Archer kind of went off on a crazy mission on his own a bit and did some really interesting stuff. Um, so this example is something he did where he used an existing sound, in this case running water. And then he took the data that we gave him, the same data that Richard had to play with, and he turned it... He turned this, um, this running water sound into a different sound by shaping it using the data. So he stretched it out and he took it apart, this existing sound, using the data. So it's, it's just a different method of sonification. And I need to turn it up. It's a bit quiet, this one, sorry. Sorry. 
So you can hear that this is a very, a very weird sound and a lot of the very weird ones that we've got are from Archer and I think that they've made the most beautiful impact on some of the compositions people have been doing. Um, they're also the hardest to understand, um, for me to understand and therefore for anyone to because I do the explaining. They also have nothing to do with the Crab Nebula which I put up here. I just love the picture. And I, <laughs> I'd already used the picture of Archer's face, so I didn't want to embarrass him by using it again in big. So that's the Crab Nebula. OK. That's enough out of you, stream. OK. So this is the end of, of my talk. Um, and I just wanted to say a few words about whatever next. So normally at this point in a talk, I think that I would say, Next, I plan to do this, that, and the other, and we've do we're doing this. And uh, I'm not going to do that here because I don't have any plans. It's kind of an open book now. For the last few months, I've done very little work on any of this. I've been separated by the Atlantic Ocean from my colleagues, um, and I don't have any time because I work 15 hours a day banging my head against a desk. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't want to. So I do want to collaborate with people in the future and to do stuff. But really, I think where I would normally say these are my plans, I would say here, I want to hear from people if they have plans. Um, and I've just said what, how happy I am really to have been involved in this so far and in the future. And I think my favourite thing that I've got from it, um, apart from having experiences like I've had all day today, um, with meeting people who have these amazing and weird and crazy ideas, it's just the, the amount of creativity that people have. And, they, you know, you can give them a little noise, like a, a squeaking thing or a, a table of numbers, and they come up with something that just blows my mind and makes me feel really happy to be involved. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a composition, which is not a noise, but is actually, I think, music, which is made purely from the sounds that we created and, and, and put on the website. It's by um, someone called Carla Scaletti, who was working with us a lot towards the more recent months of the project, and her invention, Kaima. And so I'm leaving you with this. Thank you for having me. It's quite long. <laughs> Just walk off. Mm. It's not going to play, is it? Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Carla. Oh, that's really disappointing. I've got back up. Oh, here we go. OK, this is much less problematic than I normally get, so bear with me. We'll play Carl's piece from here. Here we go. So actually, it's four minutes long. So if you want to, if people want to get up and go to the loo or have a drink of water, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Do you want me to turn it down? Okay. <laughs> If anyone has any questions for Lily, this would be a good time while we're listening to this. I'll turn it down even more. You want it on? Okay. Okay, so I'll come and have questions. Well, the question is whether any use can be made of the sonic images for actually analyzing the data. These yeah. Anomalies. So this is something that, in the, particularly in the beginning, I was really excited about. Um, slowly, as time has gone on, and the more physicists I've talked to and had cold water poured upon me, I've just lost momentum with it. I think that there's, 
there's obvious ways in which we could use our ears to analyse data, because why not? We use our eyes, our ears are great at other things. I mean, our eyes can see one octave in frequency. We, our ears can hear many, um, that's one example, but we're also, our ears are also better than eyes in many other ways. And to put them together seems like a sensible thing, but to actually implement this in the Atlas collaboration in which everyone like me is working sort of 60, 80 hour weeks on, um, on physics and getting the manpower is, even though there are 3,000 of us, is, it's proven quite soul destroying. I mean, like for example, this project's been running for two years and I'm the only physicist working on it. Um, that's what I have to contend with. <laughs> Hmm? Um, what strikes me about this project, because I know there are lots of artists out there that kind of generate interest in their work by allowing others to remix it. Yeah. In fact, um, you know, and so basically allowing, you know, saying, okay, you know, this part of the copyright allows you to do things, certain things with my work. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, so, you know, what you have here is essentially the same thing, only instead of art per se, it's data, yeah. and this is, you know, being allowed to make a composition like this uh, also reminds me of things like the LHC rap, yeah. uh, which, you know, the which was wonderful, from here. Yeah. thank you, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and um, there was another, there's sort of a dance company that does this thing, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, they basically cover, you know, the history of the universe and all the physical issues related yeah. to that in a, an hour or so. And so uh, this just seems like uh, you know, another opportunity to do that sort of thing. Mm. I'm getting to a question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, you have obviously a lot of collaborators working with this. I'm just wondering, uh, what is sort of the public response and have other people been approaching you about using Well, it's been project? absolutely wonderful. I mean, it's been mind-blowing, the response that we've had from the public and from the creative world has been mind-blowing. Um, you know, we, we had to move the website, it got crashed because there was so much interest and yeah. all the, you know, the thousands of emails and people phoning and really great stuff. So we were surprised by how it took off. It took people's imaginations, I think. Um, yeah, you did ask a question. Did I answer it? <laughs> I like hearing that it's that it is it is popular because you know it was it's hugely so accessible, popular. which of course yeah. has outreach aspect and engagement aspect, and uh, people nowadays with the technological tools they have yeah. are very very good at, at remixing. As it yeah. Is. So I think one of the one of the questions that I asked earlier was why do we use, why don't we use our ears? Why do we use our eyes to analyze data and not our ears? And I think one of the answers I gave myself quite early on was that. We've had sort of printed material and, and sort of digital printed material around for quite some time. We've also had sort of computer-aided graphics have been progressing very rapidly, but have done so from a while ago. You know, from, we've got a couple of decades on that. Um, whereas digital sound is, is perhaps a little bit behind. I mean, are we, are we progressing more rapidly now than we perhaps were in the 80s with that? Uh, shall I just take that out? No. Sorry. Can we live with that little noise? Yeah, sorry. Oh, Hello. I'm an, I'm an artist. Yeah. I'm thrilled that I understood anything you said. Oh, thanks. Good. I'm so <laughs> glad. I mean, it's I probably, go back yeah. on physics, but yeah. uh, this is what my question is. I, I had done an art show where I had photographed people who were blind, mm -hmm. and I had the photographs reproduced as touchable art so that people were blind. Oh, wonderful. Right, yeah. And they chose to call the show facial vision, which is another word for echolocation. Okay. And echolocation is the ability of individuals to experience sound not as it is generated, but as they experience it. Okay. So my question is, you know, your collision sound is, mm. the, col is the generation of the collision sound a representation of the initiation, or does it have anything to do with how the particles that are also present are receiving that? 
It is exactly about how the, the other particles are receiving it. So, okay. the, so, so it is actually sound of echolocation? Yeah, kind of. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to really put it in a box what it is, but I think like for the example that I was I maybe discussing with Zach earlier, is someone said to me, what, what is um, these jets? Like, what are they? Like, what do they look like? Are they this big or how big are they? And was asking me to explain more about them. And, I said, oh, they're about from here to the end of that room in the detector. They only exist really in the detector because they are particles being detected. So in fact, this whole room is full of particles. Um, you've got neutrinos streaming through your body right now. I like to think um, you've got 300 going through your thumbnail every second. They just don't interact with you. Mm -hmm. But there's other ones that are interacting with you. So there's photons pouring down on you, reflecting off you. That's why I can see you. Um, but the particles that are in this jet, they could also be present here, but we can't see them because there's no detector. Um, so when you say, so when you say, do the particles that are also present reflect that sound? Do they kind of, does their presence affect it? Absolutely. Um, just like a, a stick hitting that chair would not sound the same as a stick hitting the air because that's the difference. I mean, there would be no real sound, whereas here you've got a detector, you're detecting the sound. Yeah. All right. Hmm. Particle physics question? Yeah. You mentioned that quarks are indivisible. Yes. 130 years ago, atoms. <laughs> How do yeah. we know quarks don't come apart? Um, we don't. We don't know anything. But we believe that they don't. So for one of the differences between quarks and atoms is, apart from the fact that we're much smarter now and much more likely to be right, <laughs> is that we don't, we haven't actually observed a quark on its own. Um, they exist bound up in atoms. They are really an invention of our minds anyway. We accept this, we acknowledge it. Perhaps we don't promote it to the public very much, but we, don't, we, didn't, we invented the idea of quarks. Well, uh, a guy called Murray Gell-Mann did. Um, he had the idea that these new particles that we were finding um, had certain properties that we could understand if they were all made of three little or two little things that he called quarks. Um, no one listened to him and time went on and more and more particles were found and they all fitted into his beautiful theory. That's how these things develop. We're now so sure that all our answers will fit into this theory that we say quarks are real, they're actual real things and uh, they're fundamental. It's where we are now, so 50 years, maybe quarks don't even exist. It's possible. Mm. Have you heard anything about how uh, particles, some particles, I think it was at CERN, uh, went faster than the speed of light? Mm. And do you think that has, maybe, if that is true, and I mean, I'm sure I've read so many people that are like really against it, they're like, no, it's just, I mean, I'm all for it, I'm up optimistic, again, <laughs> let's do it. But right. Then that, does that have anything to do maybe with maybe where the antimatter went? I don't think so. I think that the neutrino, the neutrinos going faster than light is something that I think they were right to publish and to talk about it because that's what they observed. But I think that there is um, an uncertainty in their measurement that they've missed. And when they find out what it is, we will realise that the neutrinos are not going faster than light. I mean, a, public, a paper was published about ten, seven, ten days ago um, by a couple of theorists um, showing that they can't do this. Uh, lots of people are... I mean, one of the problems with it, that my main problem is that this experiment that called OPERA, which made this measurement, the whole experiment is based on the principle that special relativity holds. And if these things have gone faster than the speed of light, special relativity, relativity does not hold. So it just contradicts the fact that they've even done the experiment. It doesn't work on any level for me. And it, can't, it just can't be true. <laughs> yeah.